Good morning, brothers and sisters. <clears throat> Welcome back to this week's study. As we resume our conversation and study in Daniel chapter 10, shall we ask our Heavenly Father now for his guidance, his blessing, and his direction so that we may more clearly understand that which is being presented for our edification. Shall we now seek him in prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity we have to open your word and to study. We ask, Father, for your forgiveness of our sins, that you will show us that which we have forgotten, that you will help us to understand what we are to read so that we may make more sense of what these symbols mean for us today. Direct us now. May your angels attend us. May our minds be enlightened by your spirit. We need you. We cannot progress without you. We thank you now. We praise you for this opportunity. We ask for your continued watch care. We thank you for these opportunities to learn more of you so that our characters may grow to become more like yours. For this, we thank you. For this, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, now I believe we had asked through verse 13 yesterday. Any comments about where we, we ended up? So I know we were, we were addressing and questioning whether initially this was Gabriel. And I believe we came and agree that this is Gabriel that has come and touched Daniel. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's it's Gabriel. Um, so, and, and and it's a little bit confusing for people reading it. I mean, because as I said, I'm having a discussion with the guy about it, and um, you know, he gets confused over it. And you know, and I myself, you know, it took a while to really sort it out exactly what's happening. But since Gabriel touches him in chapter eight, eighteen, and nine, twenty one. And Gabriel is the one that's talking here. So we, we see Christ in vision. And then he's going to be referred to as Michael. Now, in verse 13, we haven't really addressed it. But we got up to verse 12, I think. So verse 13, we haven't looked at what Uriah Smith says on this verse yet, I don't think. Okay. <clears throat> but to to go forward with what you were just saying, we have... Daniel being touched in chapter 8, verse 18. Daniel being touched again in, in chapter 9. And here we are in chapter 10. He's touched for a third time. Yeah, well, he's going to be touched three times in chapter 10. Okay. Um, and, and so what we have is a representation of the three angels' messages. Right. But like the first angel contains all three in this case the third time that he's touched is going to contain all three so in, in writing my paper on this i'm actually addressing that um that structure and um and the significance of it in the context of the three angels messages and okay. connecting because this is the mar the mara vision is the mar mara <clears throat> is right. the 300 days, and this is the Mara, which is the, the looking glass vision. And the looking glass vision here is uh, is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, you could say, well, you know, he Jesus is, is, is seen in, you could argue, you know, Jesus is seen in chapter 8 because Palmonah is mentioned. But really, the description of Christ that we have in chapter 10 is what John has in chapter one of Revelation, right? So in Revelation, John is going to have that revelation of Christ at the beginning of his vision. Of course, he has one vision in the book of Revelation. But in Daniel, we have many visions, but it's going to be the last vision where he has the revelation of Jesus Christ. And then that, uh, you know, tried, purged, made white, that purged, uh, you know, that statement that we have what in 1135 and and uh 12 
Okay. Verse, which whichever verse it is. Um, purified, made white, and tried. So we have those descriptions as well as the three angels' message. So that that symbolism or that structure of you know justification, sanctification, judgment, however you want to look at it, um, is is part of this structure of of Daniel's messages. And you know. It, it, where would we first have um, that that symbolism that we that three step testing prophetic message? Where would we first have it in scripture? Have we ever nailed that down where we first see it? Is it in the covenants of Abraham that it's represented, or is there something before that? Is it in the covenants with Abraham, or is it before the covenants with Abraham in the Garden of Eden? Yeah, that's what I'm wondering here, because in the Garden of Eden in chapter 3, it, it should be represented in that first gospel promise in some way. Right. Now, we're going to have, you know, maybe the way to look at it is there's uh, three curses, and they, they, in a sense, would typify, the, because those curses are actually blessings. Yeah. Just not seen as such. <laughs> so future but you're going to have uh, the serpent being cursed and uh, then the woman being cursed and then adam being cursed well in in the situation with adam it's going to be the ground that's cursed but but still it's it's for adam because he's the one that has to supply the needs um but even within you know i would I'd have to look at that a little bit more so he's going to say he's going to curse the ground um, with the thorns and the thistles. And then he says, in the sweat of thy face, thou shalt eat bread till thou return unto the ground. Um, so I, I don't see three steps in any of the curses on there on by themselves. Uh, with the woman, I'll greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception, and sorrow shall thou bring forth children. And thy desire to, shall be unto thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. There's almost three there. You could say the pain of childbirth, uh, the desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And um, so that uh, that that the woman, the desire there is, is the idea of long longing or stretching. So that is the woman is dependent upon a husband, but because of that, he's going to rule over the woman. So he's going to be a governor. He has to care for her. So there's almost three in that one. But anyway, um, I guess we would have to put it to Genesis chapter three in some way, at least with the three curses. And then we can see the three covenants to Abraham. And then the fourth, of course, when he offers up Isaac. That would be it. But, um, but this revelation of Jesus Christ I mean, it's first in the Garden of Eden here, too, in the sense of Christ as a Savior. But we know Abraham, you know, he has a revelation of Christ as well, which I would put as Genesis 15. Um, the second time the covenant's given, I would think. I don't know. It's just something I haven't, I haven't thought about before. But the three touches are pretty important, so we will we will look okay. at those, the description of them and what they mean symbolically. But we know the first one, he's going to be touched, and because he's going to be flat on his face, and he's going to be set up on his knees in the palms of his hands. That's verse 10. And then he's going to be told to stand up, and then he's going to be standing, and then he's going to be told, fear not, from the first day that thou set thine heart to understand. And to chasten myself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. So that's sort of where we finished yesterday. Okay. So here in verse 13, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one in 20 days, but lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. How often the prayers of God's people are heard, while as yet there is no apparent answer. It was even so in this case with Daniel. 
the angel tells him that from the first day he set his heart to understand, his words were heard. Yet Daniel continued to afflict his soul with fasting and to wrestle with God for three full weeks, all unaware that any respect was yet paid to his petition. <clears throat> but why was this delay? The king of Persia withstood the angel. The answer to Daniel's prayer involves some action on the part of that king. This action he must be influenced to perform. It, is, it doubtless pertained to the work which he was to do in behalf of the temple at Jerusalem and the Jews. His decree for the building of that temple being the first of the series which finally constituted that great commandment to restore and build Jerusalem from which the prophecy dates. And the angel is dispatched to influence him to go forward in accordance with the divine will. Okay, well, I have to comment on this again. So so since he's going to put it as 534 BC, he doesn't really have any reason what, he doesn't have any explanation for what's going on, right? right. He just says, well, it must be something to do with the building of the temple. But we know that the foundation of the temple has already been laid um, on the second second month in 535 BC, right? So I don't know what action Cyrus would be doing a year after they've already been building the temple. There's no mention of it anywhere else that there's any any action of Cyrus. The only action that we have is that he's going to give this decree, right? Right. And, and, and of course, we know that decree, it's going to talk about it in uh, Ezra chapter 1, right, on uh, the first year of Cyrus. Now, uh, just to bring up some of the chronological details of this. So... We, we know that, in, and this is where I want to clarify this, this point of how you'll see this discrepancy addressed. There's a few different ways that people try to deal with it. So one is, some people will say that the first year of Cyrus is, is always from the fall of Babylon. And so there are people who actually put the decree in the spring of 538 B.C. So, okay. So that Cyrus is going to be the general for uh, uh, Darius the Mede, right? And so in the fall of 539, Babylon is going to fall on October 13th. And then, and then they say, well, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, Ezra 1-1, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, and he made a proclamation throughout the kingdom and also put it in and put it also in writing, right? So they will say, um, and, and here, also in verse 2, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven, hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Right? So that he's, this decree is going to be, you know, all of you can go back to Jerusalem, and and you can begin building this this house. Now, he's referring to the Lord God of heaven hath given me the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem. He's referring to the prophecy of Isaiah, right? And that's going to be Isaiah uh, 44 and 45. So Isaiah 44, right at the end, you're going to have, uh, and thus, and that Seth of Cyrus, so there's all these different things that the Lord is, is saying. And he says that Seth of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built and to the temple, thy foundation shall be laid. In chapter 45, the next verse, thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him and to loose the loins of kings, uh, referring to what happened in Daniel chapter 5 when uh, Belshazzar's knees smote one against the other, um, to open before him the two leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. 
I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight, and I will break in pieces the gates of brass and will cut in sunder the bars of iron. And I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places. And that's reference to Babylon, right? That thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by thy name, am the God of Israel. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, mine elect, I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. So Cyrus is being named here in the book of Isaiah, 100 or so years uh, before the fall of Babylon. But it's, it's, it's pretty amazing, actually, when you think about it. Of course, critics will just say it was written afterwards. But, uh, it, you know, Cyrus has seen this document. He's, he's had it pointed out to him by Daniel. So the, I would think most likely the struggle that's in the heart of Cyrus is in, in giving this decree, because that would be something that would be hard from, from the perspective of a king, right? So, so he has to consider this decree. So if we're going to count the first year as in, in the book of Ezra, Ezra 1, verse 1, if we're going to count that as just when Babylon falls, well, Cyrus wouldn't be the one who would have the authority to issue that decree because Darius is actually the main king, right? Okay. Right, Darius the Mead. So, so even though that's Cyrus what his, his, his uncle or his nephew? His uncle. So, so Cyrus is the nephew because Darius the Mede is 62 years old, I believe, at that time, or he dies at 62. Cyrus is quite a bit younger. Now, Cyrus has been uh, king of, of Persia, the Persian part of the empire, since uh, 559 BC, so for 20 years. It's sort of similar to the time that Belshazzar has been uh, the second in command of of Babylon, Cyrus has been, in a sense, the second of, of command in the Medo-Persian Empire. So, so we would have to say that Ezra is counting the first year of Cyrus in the spring of 536. So when we looked at Daniel chapter 1, verse 21, where it says that Daniel continued until the first year of Cyrus, well, it is either the first year of Cyrus, as Ezra 1 1 has it. Or it could be, and I think to be consistent within the book of Daniel, what we talked about yesterday, which I've never considered before, is that Daniel would be counting the first year from the fall of Babylon, while Ezra is going to count the first year from uh, Cyrus take, coming to the throne with the death of Darius the Mede. Either way, there, there, there is an apparent discrepancy. And there are a couple of different ways to resolve it. But for some, they want to have the first year of Cyrus to be consistent. Uh, but that's usually an older view before we actually understood the history of what actually occurred. Um, that is, in the past, before all the archaeological evidence, people just generally saw uh, Cyrus is going to conquer Babylon. And that's the first year of his reign, right? So there is, so it, it, there's just, there, there's a discrepancy and different people have tried to resolve it. But I think the best way is to say that Daniel is consistent. That he calls the first year of Cyrus, he's going to count it from the fall of Babylon. But Ezra is going to count the first year of Cyrus as Cyrus himself would have counted it as king of Babylon. So this puts 536 as the time in which the decree is issued. But some people put it in 538. So just noting that. But I thought, I thought, you know, it's it's something that's going to be in detail in the paper. But people need to know that because you're going to find all of these, you know, different people with different dates, and it can be a bit confusing. And especially since some people just they have the fall of Babylon in 538. 
you know, in the past, like people didn't know when Babylon fell, what time of year or anything. Right. So, you know, now we have a contemporary document that tells us exactly the date Babylon falls, which is October 13th. So we know that that 538 on the chart would be the Jewish year 538 beginning in the fall of 538. So it's going to be the 16th day of the seventh month that Babylon falls. That's going to be 16 days into the Jewish year 538, if we count the Jewish civil year. But, but yeah, all these little uh, chronological details, they do become important in understanding the periods of 70 years and decrees. So, you know, we know that Ellen White says, that there's going to be 70 years from uh, when Cyrus comes to the throne. Uh, that's the completion of the 70 years from when the first Hebrew captors, captives were carried away to Babylon. And, and so there's no way that we could have uh, Cyrus's decree happening in 538, because that would only be like 68 years and and a half since Daniel was carried away, right? So in working this all out, it, it's pretty clear. We know exactly when Cyrus issued his decree, April 23rd, 536. Okay. So Smith continues. Ah, how little do we realize what is going on in the unseen world in relation to human affairs. Here, as it were, the curtain is for a moment lifted and we get a glimpse of the movements within. Daniel prays. The creator of the universe hears. The command is issued to Gabriel to go to his relief. But the king of Persia must, and I have to question what this word is, before Daniel's prayer is answered. And the angel hastens to the Persian king. Satan, no doubt, musters his forces to oppose. They meet in the royal palace of Persia. All the motives of selfish interest and worldly policy which Satan can play upon, he doubtless uses to the best advantage. While Gabriel brings to bear his influence in the other direction. The king struggles between conflicting emotions. He hesitates, he delays. Day after day passes away. Daniel prays on. The king still refuses to yield to the influence of the angel. Three weeks expire, and lo, a mightier than Gabriel takes his place in the palace of the king, and Gabriel appears to Daniel to acquaint him with the progress of events. From the first, said he, your prayer was heard. But these three weeks, during which you have been praying and fasting, the king of Persia resisted my influence and prevented my coming. Now, do we agree with that? So well, yeah, there's a few problems. Now, it, it, I think he's saying that the king of Persia must wait until uh, Daniel's prayer is answered, or must must wait before Daniel's prayer is answered. Well, I'm I'm trying to find it right now in in the original article. So yeah, okay, yeah, okay. So, I mean, obviously. We, we, we're, we're getting a view behind the scenes that we're going to agree with. But to me, the battle right. is over the heart of Cyrus, right, in him making a decision. So, I mean, I, I wouldn't think that after Cyrus has already allowed the Jews to go back to Babylon, that we would see this battle going on, you know, two years later. So obviously this would have to be in the context of this now um you know and he's going to mention of course the the three weeks which we say those 21 days represent the 21 years from uh daniel's vision in daniel chapter 8. so there's 21 years between these two visions yeah so the king of persia resisted my influence and prevented my coming now so i don't think he quite um gets this point um, which is going to be in verse 13, because he, he's commenting here on verse 12. And this isn't in the book, Daniel, in Revelation, this paragraph, because in verse 13, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. Well, the prince of the kingdom of Persia 
is obviously not the king of Persia. And, and so the one that withstood him or um, opposed him, right? That's, it's two different Hebrew words to get that. To stand opposed to me 21 days. Now, so this is Gabriel speaking. Then he's going to mention Michael. So when we get to verse 13, we'll see that a bit more clearly. We'll go through that. So I don't think, I don't think Uriah Smith quite sees that. The, the people involved here. Uh, okay. Yeah. So is that, I'm not quite. I'm not quite sure what 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 he's saying here. But anyway, did you find what he's what that word is? I'm looking. Okay. But, ah, but the king of Persia must act before Daniel's prayer is answered. Oh. Must act. Yep. Okay, I see. So he has to make a decision before Daniel's prayer is answered. Correct. Yeah, and 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 which I believe is the decree. Um, Uriah Smith doesn't see what that decree, what what the issue is. Okay, so that makes sense. Okay, change the tact. Okay, but yeah, so there is a struggle going on in the heart of Cyrus, and and so Cyrus is going to act, and then Daniel is going to be told that his prayer has been answered. So they have to wait for this decision. So I would agree with that there. Okay. Okay. Smith continues. Such was the effect of prayer. And God has erected no barriers between himself and his people since Daniel's time. It is still their privilege to offer up prayer as fervent and effectual as his and like Jacob, to have power with God and to prevail. So now this statement that God has erected no barriers between himself and his people since Daniel's time, is this disagreeing with Christ as our intercessor? Or is this just a different way of stating something? It's just a different way of stating it. He's just saying God hasn't erected any barriers between. So all he's saying is that we always have had access to God, right? God has no barriers it, since Daniel's time. It's not like Daniel had some privilege we don't have, right? That's the idea. Now, of course, we know that Christ is the mediator between God and Daniel, and that's always been true, right, okay. between the Father. So. Okay. Who is Michael who, who here came to Gabriel's assistance? The term signifies he who is like God. And the scriptures clearly show that Christ is the one who bears this name. Jude verse 9 tells us that Michael is the archangel. Archangel signifies head or chief angel. And Gabriel in our text calls him one, or as the margin reads, the first of the chief princes. This can be but one archangel. And hence it is manifestly proper to use the word in the plural. The scriptures, or excuse me, and hence it is manifestly improper to use the word in the plural. The scriptures never so use it. Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4.16 states that when the Lord appears the second time to raise the dead, the voice of the archangel is heard, whose voice is heard when the dead is raised, the voice of the Son of God, John 5.28. Putting these scriptures together, they prove, first, that the dead are called from their graves by the Son of God. Second, that the voice that is then heard is the voice of the archangel. The archangel, therefore, is the Son of God. Third, the archangel is called Michael. Therefore, Michael is the Son of God. In the last verse of Daniel 10, he is called your prince. And in the first of chapter 12, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, expressions which can appropriately be applied to Christ and not to any other. Yeah, and and we also remember that uh, in Jude, Michael the archangel is going to be referred to as well. Right. And what what is he going to be doing? What reference in Jude are you using? Okay, so that's going to be verse 9. Okay. Yeah, Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, 
Right. I did not bring against him a railing accusation, but said that the Lord rebuked thee. Right. So this, this is going to be uh, Christ and Satan disputing about the body of Moses. That is when Moses is resurrected. And we know Moses is resurrected okay. because he appears with Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration. One representing those that are alive when Jesus comes, one representing those that are resurrected when Jesus comes. So we see that Michael is a title used in when Satan is in conflict with Christ. And of course, we have the term archangel in the New Testament in replacing uh, the one of, of uh, how does it go in Daniel? Now, what was the words there? The chief, which is Rosh, right, or Rishon, uh, princes, right, which is the word Sar. So he's going to be called uh, Ichad Rishon Asar, the one chief prince or the, the first chief prince or the only chief prince, that is the only archangel, right? That's the idea in Daniel 10, 13. There is only one archangel, so you know your eyes Smith has it right here. I just would have used the Jude reference as well, as what well, because the one in in obviously in First Thessalonians four sixteen is pretty important to show that the archangel is Christ. There is there isn't a bunch of archangels. You know, Gabriel's not an archangel, right? Yeah, there's only one. There can only be one. Archangel. Okay. Now, the next verse, as presented. Okay, so before the next verse. So yes. um, just referring to here, we have um, the prince of the kingdom of Persia. So you're going to have this word sar, which is prince. So you have the prince of the kingdom of Persia, and you have Michael, one Repeat, of the chief please. princes. So you have the prince of the kingdom of Persia. Right. That's the word star in Hebrew. And Michael, one of the chief princes. So if we think about this here, uh, the prince of the kingdom of Persia is not Melek, right? Melek means king. So you're going to always see uh, Cyrus is being referred to as the king of Persia, right, in 10 verse 1. So you're going to have Malik, king. So in verse 13, when it talks about the prince of the kingdom of Persia, that is not Cyrus, right? It, it's going to be Satan. So he doesn't explicitly point this out. And so you can see why Michael then is called the first of the chief princes. Because here, this, this prince, this this title prince is is used in this conflict between Christ and Satan. Does that make sense? That Satan is a prince, but Christ is the chief prince, okay. the only chief prince. And and this would this would speak to Satan challenging Christ's throne. Is that because Satan wants to be the head of the angels, right? Now, why is he called though the, the prince of the kingdom of Persia? Because he is one of the leaders, or, or how would you how would you approach it? Okay, what is Satan claiming to be? He he is he wants to be the ruler of this world, right? Right, right. Okay, so he he wants to be the prince Agreed. of the kingdom of Persia. That is what he is. That's a role that he is asserting. Okay. Right. That he is the one in control of this world. He's the king of this world. And so the word there is going to be the word prince in contrast to Christ being the chief prince or the archangel, the one who's in charge of all the angels. So so that's why we have that word prince of the kingdom of Persia, because Persia is the kingdom at that time that is dominating God's people. You're going to see later uh, where he's going to talk about uh, he's going to return to fight with the prince of Persia in verse 20. So that's going to be Satan. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grisha shall come. That means 
the prince of, of Persia and the prince of Grisha are both Satan. Satan is after Persia shows favor towards God's people. The next kingdom that's going to come along is Greece, right? And that's going to be through Satan's power that Greece is then going to dominate God's people. So the prince of, of Persia and the prince of Grisha are both Satan because he is the prince of this world. There is a verse dealing with this. I'm trying to think where it is. Yeah, so this is in Ephesians 2.2, 2, where it says, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So can we see that Satan is the prince of the power of the air? That he's the prince of Persia and that he's the prince of Grisha? Okay. That makes sense? I know I end up doing all this talking, but any, anybody else have thoughts on that? Anybody have uh, thought about that before or not? I cannot honestly say that I have thought about it. Now, there is another place. The first place I ever ran across uh, this this idea of this prince um, was in Ezekiel, and that's going to be dealing with Gog and Magog, and that's chapter. Uh, so this is kind of interesting too. Uh, so in Ezekiel thirty eight verse one, uh, it says, "And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog." the chief prince of Meshik and Tubal, and prophesy against him. So here you're going to again have this uh, idea of a prince. Now here in this context, they're not going to use the word Sar. Um, they're going to use uh, the word Nasi, which it means exalted one, that is the king or Sheik, also a captain, a chief, etc. cetera. Um, so here it's translated as prince, but it is going to have this word uh, rosh, right? So related to the word rashon, uh, so 7218. So if we think about who the chief prince of Meshik and Tubal is in the Gog, the land of Magog, that this is again a reference to Satan, right? Now, we know that Meshik and Tubal, this is referring to Moscow and a Tubalski, so that's this is referring to Gog, the land of Magog, is what we would call Russia, historically, right? But it's going to be used as a type of, of Satan, right? Satan's kingdom. And, and again, it says, and say, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshik and Tubal. Okay, so I, I don't know if anybody had ever looked at that before. Anyway. That's uh, another reference that we could tie into uh, to address the prince of the kingdom of Persia, and the prince of Grisha. He's also the chief prince so, of Meshik and Tubal, so this power. Um, so he's claiming the, the place of Christ. Right? That's, that's what Satan is, is challenging. He's challenging Christ. And... And then in, in chapter 39, it says, therefore, thou son of man prophesy right. against Gog and says, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. So it's going to be in chapter 39 as well. Um, so it's a pretty interesting prophecy. Uh, there's a group that's an offshoot of, of the Millerite movement uh, that we were talking about before, that is the age to come people. Right. Um, that age to come people developed into a group uh, called, think of the name. Oh, what is the name of it? Here, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you in a second because it's kind of interesting. I, I've been to one of their evangelistic series before. Christadelphians, that's what they're called. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of Christadelphians. Uh, there's not many of them left, but they were an offshoot that w was, is connected to the age to come movement that age to come movement that Uriah Smith was talking about. 
a branch of them developed into the Christadelphians. Um, so it was kind of kind of an interesting. Uh, I ended up back when early on when I was an Adventist, I, I ended up going to one of their evangelistic series, and it, a lot of the stuff was similar to us when it came to prophecy. But they really focused on this uh, chapter 38 and 39 of Ezekiel. So. Yeah, the Church of God and the Christadelphians came out of that. Anyway, that's that's a lot of information. Somebody might be interested watching this video in, in that. Okay. Now, as we had addressed yesterday, we were going through the verses where we were addressing the vision that Daniel was seeing. And... This vision was the Mara. Now we come to verse 14. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days. For yet the vision is for many days. Smith comments, the expression, the vision is yet for many days, reaching far into the future and embracing what should befall the people of God even in the latter days shows conclusively that the days given in that vision, namely the 2300, cannot mean literal days, but must mean days of years. What's the problem with Smith's comment? Okay, well, I was hoping somebody else would answer. I feel like I'm back in university when I was taking uh, uh, all my religion courses with Dr. Nelson. I was the only one who ever answered his questions. But... uh, (laughs) Okay, so can because yeah, so so you you can point out the problem instead of me pointing it out. All right, if we are using Esword, if we are paying attention to what we're talking about here, Daniel ten fourteen is giving reference, stating that for yet the calzone is for many days. What? How do we view the calzone vision? Well, definitely this is a reference to the 2520. Exactly. Here is Smith. He is confusing the symbols. Now, now the, the point here, too, is we know that the calzone includes Babylon, right? Right. 2300 days doesn't include Babylon. It becomes in the time of Medo-Persia. Right. Right? So, so that's the... Mara vision, the 70 weeks, or pardon me, the 2300 days. And Mara. right, the Mara is the 2300 days, the vision of the evenings and the mornings, right? We have the 70 weeks, which is the Debar, and we have the Chazon, which is the 2520. So, so he hasn't, he hasn't figured that out because he's rejected the 2520. But if he had if he had paid attention, he would have he would have seen seen that. And Miller, even though Miller doesn't, you know, understand Hebrew, he recognizes that that there is this these two desolating powers. So he's right. going to recognize that the twenty three hundred days is starting in the time of Persia, and yet there is a longer period that begins with Babylon. He doesn't delineate it in in great detail, but it is an underlying uh, premise of his argument for Daniel chapter eight. And 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 if you don't have this premise in Daniel chapter eight, you don't have a starting point for the twenty three hundred days, right? And and you have no way to explain, you know, if you're going to have uh, the daily as being Christ's heavenly ministry, then you have to wait till the daily is taken out of the way for the twenty three hundred days to begin, which would be the logical view if you think the daily is Christ's heavenly ministry or Christ's ministry in any way. You would at least have to, and and, and that's the thing I have a hard time with with our theologians in that they say, well, it's Christ's ministry is taken away by the papacy. I mean, that means the earliest you could start the 2300 days is 538. And if you, if you say it's Rome, then the earliest you could do that is, you know, um, whenever Rome begins, however you're going to start Rome. But 
uh, it definitely has to be the daily has to go all the way back uh, to to include Babylon. And so the zone is divided into two different periods, the daily and the abomination of desolation. Well, the other question that I had to ask when I was reading Smith's premise is part of the presentation here. What does this do to Pruitt's presentation that Daniel has come out of the 70 weeks captivity or excuse me set the 70 years captivity and now is facing a much longer time i mean he he said this would have just depressed daniel and would have made it very difficult for him to go forward yeah i mean i mean that was a real problem with pruitt and 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 it's a problem that a lot of people who oppose the 2520 make is they just say well how can there be this long period Right, so that's the argument Pruitt makes. But yet, they forget about the 2,300 days. We know they end at the same time. So it, it, it's kind of shooting yourself exactly. in the foot. You, you can't have it both ways. No, you can't have it both ways in any manner. Yeah, yeah that's what I said. You can't have it both ways. Yeah, you, you, you have to have, I guess, you know, the problem that I have is, just it's frustrating again you know I, I get frustrated when when there's just when people are illogical and they can't see they can't see their argument they can't they can't see past what it is they're arguing because when people are arguing in this way they're not taking into account everything they're fighting against something and, and we we have to be careful that we don't do that um, because what we do is we create what I call ad hoc arguments. That is, we argue something. It's like somebody who's saying, you know, a Sunday keeper, oh, the law was nailed to the cross, right? They will say that when you're talking about the seventh day Sabbath. But they generally don't, aren't consistent because they're not going to say that about adultery or murder or, you know, idols or, you know, taking the Lord's name in vain or anything like that, right? Right. So argument changes depending on who they're arguing against and what they're arguing. That is, they don't have a consistent argument. Um, and this was even when I first came to understand the state of the dead. You know, I would see this, this done uh, over and over again by people who are arguing against the idea that, you know, that when you die, you're dead until the resurrection. They would use some verses, and then yet they would talk about the resurrection of the dead, right? There just wasn't a consistency. And, and so we need to understand the whole picture, and our arguments should always be consistent, right? It, like, for instance, you can't say nothing happened in 677 BC, um, that Manasseh wasn't taken captive there and yet believe um, all of the chronology dealing with, with the Bible. Like, you can't just change chronologies whenever you want. You can't just change arguments, argue one thing one day for one thing, and then the opposite thing the other day for another thing. And, and that's sort of the problem we have with the arguments against the 2520, it's inconsistent. So we need to be consistent in how we understand things. And that takes time takes a lot of work. It also takes us the effort to rightly divide the word of truth. Because if we're not willing to put in the effort, how are we ever going to come to an understanding? Yeah, you know, and this, this brings up a point, you know, that I've been dealing with, you know, the role of, of Bible study. So we know, uh, and we talked a bit about this yesterday, there's, you know, there's this intellectual idea that we need to study God's word, right? So we have to apply the intellect. But we know that God's word needs to reach the heart, right? That is, we have to internalize all of these things that we study. We're not just studying this to get a bunch of head knowledge. We're not studying this so that we can argue against other people and show other people wrong, right? That's not why we're looking at what Uriah Smith is saying and pointing out is, is error. We're not, we're not trying to attack Uriah Smith as a person because 
in a sense, Uriah Smith represents us. We are no different than Uriah Smith. We're no different than anyone else who has not fully understood the truth because we have not fully understood the truth. We're coming to an understanding of the truth. And we know that that intellectual understanding is is not an end unto itself, right? Correct. There's, there's, a, there's a purpose. That purpose is to reflect Christ's character. And that means that when we approach God's word, we have to approach it in the character of Christ. We can't approach God's word in an argumentative manner. You know, you know, Satan and Christ fighting over the body of Moses, you know, it says that, that he'd bring not against him, against Satan, uh, a railing accusation that says the Lord rebuke thee, right? You know, and so often we, we bring railing accusations against others. We're, we're, we're fighting against flesh and blood in our minds and not recognizing that we're fighting against uh, principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places, right? So, so we get caught up in that whole. We we actually enter onto Satan's ground. So I think this is, um, you know, really important to understand how we understand truth. That if you're going to understand truth, you have to be converted. It, it's it's not just an intellectual exercise. And yet, for many, it is. Correct. I mean, they're fighting over this this sort of territory of of ideas as if they're fighting against a person instead of trying to understand the truth. And and if you look at that basic thing that we've just discussed, that premise of, then you can see why Ellen White says, if a brother differ with you, you know, don't make him out to be heretic. Don't misrepresent his views, but sit down with him in the spirit of Christ, opening the scriptures, going point by point, considering that you may be in error, right? To approach the scriptures in that way is so contrary to human nature. And yet we, we sometimes give lip service to it, but we, we still do it. And I find that, you know, this antagonism that we have experienced, you know, within the movement. And, and even people who comment on the videos, you know, who have been in the movement, they, it can be quite antagonistic, you know, judging our characters based upon that we disagree. Just because somebody disagrees with me is not a reason for me to judge their character. I, I can't just say because somebody disagrees with me, therefore they're proud. You know, you have a difference of opinion. There's something wrong with you spiritually. We all believe things. That that could be incorrect, right? Right, because we we do because we've changed our views on many things. We've been incorrect in the past, and we're we're constantly being corrected. But just because somebody has a difference of opinion, you know, um, or a different view, I should not be judging that person's character. Now, person's characters can be flawed, and and sometimes that can be manifested in the views that they take, but I think it's much more in the attitude that they take that is actually the real issue. The reason why we end up with wrong views is because we, we have a wrong attitude. So instead of being open-minded and willing to study the scriptures together, we, we, we stand defensively. No. And so, anyway, go on. As a side note, Mrs. White, wrote the following in letter 3 1897 you will find this in the 26th paragraph study the 10th chapter of daniel and mark particularly the 14th verse now i am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days for yet the vision the calzone is for many days when our brethren and ministers shall feel the burden that should rest upon them, they will not be content with a few surface truths. They will sink the shaft deep and will have the spirit that Daniel possessed. There will be no frivolous spirit, no cheap superficial sanctification, prated from unsanctified lips and coming from hearts that are destitute of purity, 
of consecration and wholehearted surrender to God. There will be earnest prayer that the truth may be so indelibly stamped upon the heart that the entire man may be brought with all his ways into conformity with the truth. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Romans 10.10. 10. It's interesting that she gives this admonition specifically to this chapter and verse. Yeah, so that's not a side note. I'm just giving it as a, a, a side note to what Smith had been saying. Yeah, I know. But, I mean, it's really the main point. Something further for our consideration. Yeah, yeah, I, and, and it's just what we just discussed. I mean, because, I mean, I, I, it, and it's kind of interesting. I mean, she chooses to write that in context of this verse. Right. Um, I would think, you know, I'm come to make the understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days. The opposition is for many days. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't naturally think to write that comment in connection with this verse. But we already did discuss it in connection with this verse, and then she just reiterates it. So I think that's that's pretty remarkable. So so what what Daniel needs to understand. Because he, the prophet represents God's people in the last days, right? Right. And, and, and we see this here, God's people in the latter days. What shall we call that people in the latter days? So if, if God is making Daniel to understand it, he's making us to understand it. Correct. Now, as we proceed, Daniel 10, 15. And when he had spoken such words unto me, I set my face toward the ground, and I became dumb. There are two verses that are used as reference here, especially to the portion that says, spoken such words unto me. Again, they go back to what you were referencing earlier, Daniel 8.18 and Daniel 10.9, where as 8.18 8.18 says, now as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep on my face toward the ground, but he touched me and set me upright. 10.9, yet I heard the voice of his words, and when I heard the voice of his words, then was I in a deep sleep on my face, and my face toward the ground. So this is very much, as you were pointing out, very much like what John was in condition in Revelation chapter 1. Now, now there's another reference there, too, um, which I think is interesting. So in Ezekiel 24, um, because remember, Ezekiel is going to be made dumb. Right. Okay. And and there's this prophecy. So when the siege of Jerusalem begins, he's going to be told that, you know, his wife is going to die, not going to mourn her or anything like that. And that, uh, then that's going to be a type of when uh, the temple is destroyed and the people aren't to mourn the loss of the desire of their eyes, right? Your, your um, internet and dropped says, out of bed. Okay. Okay, sorry about that. So, um, so in Ezekiel 24, we know that his wife is going to die. And that becomes, uh, and he's not supposed to mourn her loss. And that becomes a type of when Jerusalem and the temple is destroyed, they're not supposed to mourn the loss of the temple. Um, and then it's going to say that there's going to be, that so the Jerusalem and the temple are going to be destroyed. Now, Ezekiel is going to be dumb until one that is escaped comes to him who has seen this with his own eyes, right? And is going to tell him, right? And then he will be no more dumb, and thou shalt be assigned unto them, and they shall know that I am the Lord. So in chapter 33, so all of the intervening chapters are addressing uh, uh, messages against the pagan nations. So, so in a sense, his dumbness is in relation to giving a message to God's people. So in chapter 33, he's going to... Uh, begin prophesying 
against. So he's going to reiterate chapter 3. Ezekiel 33 is the reiteration of chapter 3 dealing with the watchman, right? And so he's going to begin prophesying again against God's people. And then he's going to have this person come in 33 verse 21. And it came to pass in the 12th year of our captivity in the 10th month on the 5th day of the month that one had escaped out of Jerusalem came unto me saying the city is smitten. Right. And then he's going to have his mouth. Now it's going to say that his mouth was open the evening before that guy came. So that is the beginning of chapter three is the evening before. And then and on that morning, this one that has escaped is going to tell him. So he says, now the hand of the Lord was upon me in the evening of four. He that was escaped came and had opened my mouth until he came to me in the morning and my mouth was opened and I was no more dumb. Now, there's a bunch of stuff here in connection with this. So one is we have uh, Ezekiel being dumb and, and we have this in connection with the prophecy regarding uh, the destruction of Jerusalem, right? And, and, and the temple. Okay. And, and so there's a bunch of ties. I mean, there's so many little threads in here. I mean, you're going to have this evening and morning symbol dealing with the 2300 days. You're going to have uh, uh, the dumbness. You're going to have uh, this prophecy regarding Jerusalem, which, of course, is going to be in Daniel as well. There's going to be a destruction of Jerusalem. But instead of in 536, it's going to be in 70 A.D., so there's so many ways that you can connect these different verses together. Um, they're just intertwined, the prophecy of Ezekiel and the prophecies of Daniel, because they're both in captivity, right? I mean, Daniel's taking the captivity, you know, in 607 and Ezekiel in, in 597. So he's going to be taken in captivity 10 years after Daniel is. But, but they're both in Babylon. Right, which is which is rather interesting, it, and often people don't really think about that. You know, we, we just sort of think of Daniel and we think of Ezekiel, but they're both captives in Babylon, and uh, they're both prophesying regarding uh, Jerusalem. Though Daniel's prophecies are more addressing uh, the end of the captivity, right, where Ezekiel is more talking about the progression of that captivity what's going to happen you know that is you know uh, daniel never addresses the destruction of of the city and the sanctuary in his time right he only addresses the destruction of the city and the sanctuary in 70 a.d which is which is rather interesting anyway now when when we have been looking at this in the past we come to daniel 10 16 and behold one like he, or one like the similitude of the sons of men, touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spake and said unto him that stood before me, O my Lord, by the vision my sorrows are turned upon me, and I have retained no strength. So when we say behold, the reference here that was given by the translators would have been Daniel 8.15. And it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for the meaning, then behold, there stood before me the appearance of a man. So what vision are we talking about again here? The Mara. If you take a look at Daniel 8.15, I think you'll find it's the Calzone. Oh, I see what you're saying. I'm just thinking of generally the 2300 days. But yeah, so in 815 itself, the word there is going to be Kazan. Uh, okay. Now, so it's kind of interesting here in chapter 8, because it came to pass when I had seen the vision, Kazan. So that means the vision that he sees here is, is, is referring to uh, this picture of starting with Medo-Persia, because he's not going to be starting with Babylon, but he's going to be starting with Medo-Persia. So he saw a vision right, in verse 2, and in verse 1, it's going to be Kazon, right? 
But when they first bring in uh, Mara, that's going to be in context uh, with the 2300 days, right? Correct. So, for the first, where's the first time that Mara is mentioned? Is that in verse um, 16? Daniel 8 16. Okay. In, because that is definitely the Mara. That is the. Mar yeah, Mara. 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 Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so um, so that word, 4758, is, yeah, so that's going to be in Daniel. Yeah, the first time it's in Daniel is Daniel 8, 15. Let me see here. It doesn't make sense. There must be a typo on this because it says Daniel 8, 15 has Mara, but it doesn't. Yeah, it has, um, that has the Calzone. He, Oh, in the word appearance, uh, that's where it is. So, so the, it's translated as vision in uh, in other places, but in Daniel eight fifteen, it says, "And it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision, the Kazon vision, and sought for the meeting. Then behold, there stood before me as the appearance of the man of a man, right? And that is." Mara, right? That word appearance. Right. So, so he could have said, as the vision of a man, and then it would have said, make the man to understand the vision, right? So that vision, is this a vision of the appearance of the man, right? Because I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. Now, who is the one that is between the banks of the Uli. Isn't that Christ? Okay, so we know in chapter uh, 10, and we see that in chapter 12, that's going to be the Tigris, so it's a different river. Right. But there's one between the banks of the Tigris, above the waters, that's going to be Christ. So I would say the one here between the banks of the Uli also would be Christ. So this is Talmonai, right? He's saying to Gabriel, make this man to understand the Marah. Okay. And then in verse 17, so came, he came near where I stood. And when he came, I was afraid and fell upon my face. But he said unto me, understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end, so that's going to be that uh, F8, time of the end, shall be the Kazon, right? Now, that means in order to understand the 2300 days, the vision of the 2300 evenings and mornings, he's going to have to understand the Kazone, right? That that they're going to Are you end. Saying, as, you out, as you dropped out, were you saying that in order to understand the Mare, that we need to understand the Calzone? So in other words, to an understand the 2300 we must first understand the 2520. Yes, yeah, which is what Miller was able to do because he first understood the 2520. That's why he was able to understand the 2300 days, right? Because they both end at the same time. Right. Yeah, so yeah, it, it's pretty amazing once, once we put this all together. Now, the thing that that was striking me as we read this in verse 16, 10, 16, is Daniel's comment. Oh, my Lord, by the vision, my sorrows are turned upon me and I have retained no strength. Oh, my Lord, by the Mara, my sorrows are turned upon me. So by the 2300 days. Correct. Yeah, so the 23 and the days is the thing that brought his sorrow because they're so far into the future. Right. 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 That, which, again, argues against what um, uh, Eugene Pruitt was trying to, to say regarding the 2520. Exactly. So when we're looking at this, one of the, one of the points that helped me to understand and really 
focus upon the different visions goes back to Daniel 8, 26. Because this verse reads, And when the vision of the evening and the morning, which was told, is true, wherefore shut thou up the calzone, for it shall be for many days. So in, in the chronological history, Daniel is being told that the mare, the mare is true, but it is to be shut up within the calzone. Yeah, I mean, it, it's pretty interesting. <laughs> like, once we, we put this together, it, everything makes sense. It all falls into place. Right. Yeah, but, but if you don't, if you don't understand that, then it, it doesn't fit. Nothing makes sense. If you go for a very surface reading and a very surface explanation, as did Smith and as has done Pruitt, it stays very confusing because Smith has had the tools that would have allowed for him to understand that there are separate visions but he chose to overlook them because his opinion was different. Now, with Eugene Pruitt, he's in the time in which this should be understood. So we can, we can excuse your eye, Smith, in the sense that it's hidden, right? Now, it's hidden partly because they're not seeing it, right? So God has allowed that to happen at that period of time so that we right. could see it in our time. So with Eugene Pruitt, he actually had even a greater opportunity to see this than Smith did. So, because it now has been open to us. Right. Okay. So here's verse 16, giving us a good reference right back to, to Daniel 8, so that we should be able to understand the differences in these visions. Daniel is bothered. Because the 2300 days, the vision of the evening morning, is turning his sorrows upon him. For how can the servant of this, my Lord, talk with this, my Lord? For as for me, straight away, there remain no strength in me, neither is there breath left in me. Now, Smith's paragraph here. One of the most marked characteristics manifested by Daniel was the tender solicitude he felt for his people. Having come now to clearly comprehend that the vision portended long ages of oppression and suffering for the church, he was so affected by the view that his strength departed from him, his breath ceased, and the power of his speech was gone. This vision of verse 16 doubtless refers to the former vision of chapter 8. Now, in this, he's partially correct. But why is it only partially? Well, he doesn't see the two different visions. So, so in verse 16, as we pointed out, it is the Mara, but he's not recognizing his own. Right. He's not recognizing. All right, we have come to the end of our time together today. Any other thoughts, comments, or questions at this time? Yeah, okay. So, I mean, I know I talk a lot, but but this is so amazing. You know, as we, we look at these things, it's, I mean, in some ways, it's almost remarkable that we, that this hadn't been noticed either by Smith or by Eugene Pruitt. Because, you know, we knew that, you know, there is the Mara and there is the Kazon. That's been noted by, by Adventists for a long time. But, you know, Smith had the opportunity because he, know, he, knew, he knew about the 2520. And, and of course, so does Eugene Pruitt. 
but he's he's not going they're not going to examine it they're not going to take the time to figure it out and the fact that that, that this has been revealed to us i mean should be very humbling yeah right okay you, know, you know that that the one is that god's you know chosen us in a sense uh, to understand this that we're at a time in history where we can understand something that has been hidden for, you know, a couple thousand years or more, right? Correct. So, so it, it, it's just quite remarkable, and, and because we're nobody, right? We're we're not important. We're, you know, we're not the heads of churches. We're not you know great theologians or anything like that. We're just normal, simple people. And here we're seeing something, you know, that no one else had seen, right? that other people should have seen. And there's nothing to do with us as being any better than anyone else. Right? Right. In a sense it's it's probably more because we're we're not better than anyone else. We're we're God chooses the weak things of the world to confound the wise. And and we're definitely not great the great, you know, great people of the earth. But but God isn't with those that you know, God is with those that are simple people, right? I mean, I'm not saying I'm that simple, but you know what I'm saying. Right. I'm not in, in that position. Obviously, we, we exercise our minds and our intellect, and God has given us some gifts. But other people have had opportunity to find these things, and God didn't show it to them, right? We don't find these things because of anything in ourselves. God has to put us in a position where we're able to see them in his providences. And, and I want to really make that clear that sometimes people think because they find something that that means they're better than other people. But God chooses who he will, right? In a sense, you could say that God didn't choose Uriah Smith to understand it. And he didn't choose Eugene Pruitt. You understand what I'm saying? I do. Because there can be people with all kinds of intellect and all kinds of gifts and abilities. But they're not going to understand it, not because, you know, they don't have those abilities, but just because God did not, in his providence, lead them to that truth. And, you know, so all of the things that I've found, you know, dealing with, like, Ezekiel's prophecies and all these things, in no way can I imagine that that's because I'm somehow better than anyone else. Just because God chooses uh, to reveal things to us, it doesn't. It doesn't make us better, right? It does. It's just God choosing people, in 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 some ways, for for His reasons, because God has a plan. He has His providences, and and there's all different kinds of people who don't understand these things, and it doesn't mean God is not using them or working through them. He's revealed other things to them. They have other purposes. They're a part of the body of Christ. And God is overseeing all of these events, right? So sometimes people think because they found some truth that that somehow they're correct in everything that they understand and everything that they do, and they're God's chosen people and they're prophets or whatever. And 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 and, and that's not how it works. You, you dropped out again. God has, yeah, it, it's not how it works. God reveals his truth to whomever he will. And he orders the events of our lives right. for his purposes, not for ours. And, and I think that's such an important point that is rarely understood when it comes to looking at um, how, how God reveals truth to us. You know, you don't have to be a prophet, the office of a prophet, uh, to have truth revealed to you. And people often, when they find things, they want to become a prophet, right? They say, now everybody needs to listen to me. And God has many prophets, that is, many people that he is revealing truths to throughout the world. And, and we need to recognize that. So no way are we saying we're better than Uriah Smith or we're better than Eugene Pruitt, just because we see this stuff right now. Okay. Any other comment? Well, Kelly put a comment in the comments. 
I had a, I found something here that I, it's just, it's not related to the topic perhaps, but it's related to encouragement for Theodore and ourselves as we think of Theodore over in Australia. We saw a great need for a school in which promising young men and young women could be trained for the master's service. And we went right into the woods in New South Wales and purchased 1,500 acres of land and there established a training school away from the cities. And purchased three years ago, we 1,500 acres in Australia. Right. Three years ago, three years ago, we returned to America. Others were sent to Australia to take our places. The work has continued to grow. Prosperity has attended every effort. I wish you could read the letters that come to us. Doubtless you have heard the dreadful of the dreadful drought that has caused famine in so many places in Australia during the past two years. This was written, I forget, 1900s. Anyway, in the, in the past two years. Hundreds of thousands of sheep and cattle and horses have perished in all the colonies, especially in Queensland. The suffering and financial loss have been great. But the spot that was chosen for our training school has had sufficient rainfall for good pasture land and beautiful crops. In fact, in legislative assemblies and in the newspapers of the great cities, it has been specified as the only green spot in all of New South Wales. Is not this remarkable? Has not the Lord blessed? From one of the reports received, we learn that last year, 7,000 pounds of honey of the best quality has been made on the school estate. Large quantities of vegetables have been raised, and the sale of the surplus has been a source of considerable revenue for the school. All this is very encouraging to us, for we took the wild land, wild land and helped to bring it to its present fruitful state. To the Lord we ascribe all the praise. So I was just, it's pretty neat that it was the only green spot in all of New South Wales during this great salmon in Australia. So may the Lord bless your efforts, Theodore, and, and uh, make, it, make it a green spot in Australia. Okay, and so that would have been Avondale, the place that became uh, Avondale University in New South Wales. Uh, I know it's in New South Wales. Okay. I'm yeah, over, then I'm it, over then it would be. Victoria, where, I, where I'm at, near Melbourne, but... Mm -hmm. Well, you're down under. It's it's like someone in you know in another country asking if you know know his friend, but it's a big country. Oh yeah, Australia is very big. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've been finding quite a few gems in this. Uh, it's called note notebook leaflets, and it's it's quite a wonderful collection. Mm -hmm. And speaking well, thanks, to the, you're welcome. And, and thinking, uh, I was thinking too. You guys were talking earlier about um, the debating and uh, the spirit of debate and so on. And again, from 1888 sermons, uh, page 87, we would discourage the discipline that tends to make persons debaters. We urge you not to connect young men who are learning to be teachers of Bible truth with one who has a debating spirit, for they will surely receive the mold, wrong mold of character. The habitual debater is so accustomed to be clouding and turning aside evidence, and even the scriptures from the true meaning to win his point, that everything does not strike him favorably and is not in harmony with his ideas, he will combat cavilling at God's inspired work. I think that's kind of what you guys are driving at to avoid. That's all mm -hmm. I was thinking. A few thoughts there. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Okay. Shall we now close with prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for these opportunities that we've had to open your word, to study, to come to an understanding of that which you would have us to comprehend at this time in earth's history. Be with us through this day. Help us in all things so that which is done may bring glory to you. Direct our steps, our thoughts, and our efforts. Direct our words so that they may represent you in all things. Help us to this end. For this we thank you and this we praise you. 
in Jesus' name. Amen.